Now let's talk about a black metal band that's actually good, Dark Throne, one of the best black metal bands out there. But before we get any further, if you haven't noticed, I have already reviewed the first album, Soulside Journey, and I will not be talking about that album in this video, so go watch that one first. I talk about a lot of stuff with that. I didn't cover it because it's a death metal album and I kind of wanted to just get right into the black metal stuff. But of course, I know you guys and I know how lazy the human race is. So uh, your chance of actually clicking away from this video and clicking on that one and searching through all my videos to find it, it's very slim. So I guess to make a short story long, <coughs> Galv, Ivar, Ted, and Dag Nielsen formed a death metal band called Dark Throne in Norway. They're a technical death metal band with a lot of atmosphere. They got signed to Peace Film and released an album called Soul Side Journey, which is a pretty good album, and watch that fucking video already, you lazy fuckers. I don't want to have to talk about that album again. But anyways, let's continue talking about that album again. They eventually got sick of the direction that death metal was going along with every other Norwegian kid that eventually made a black metal band, especially a guy named Euronymous that they befriended from the band of Mayhem. And they were going to write and record another album, which was later called Goat Lord, which was a bunch of death metal songs that they only had instrumental demos but they never finished the album because they decided to scrap that fucking shit and go for a black metal style which they decided to release this album called Blaze in the Northern Sky which came out in 1992. Those demos were actually polished and released later on and released as Goat Lord which actually had vocals layered on the top of it by Fenris who actually did really cool black metal vocals and really weird pitch shifted women vocals on the album. It's actually a pretty decent album, go check it out. It's a great song on there called Black Diamond or something like that. There was some couple shitty songs, a couple weird moments, a couple really weird vocal stuff but it's one of the weirdest coolest albums I've ever heard. Anyways, they decided to go for a really cool necro direct when they got constantly picked on by that piece of shit Euronymous that decided to be an asshole to everybody because he hated death metal, he hated Scott Burns, he hated the production of death metal, he hated the sound of death metal, he hated the drums of death metal, he hated the guitars of death metal, he hated the sound of death metal. So a bunch of bands in the scene decided to go anti that direction, and decided to make something that sounded really horrible, very ugly, very evil. So they decided to make this thing called black metal, right? So Darth Vader was really influenced to go in this direction of black metal by Euronymous, who would later be terminated by the savior of black metal himself, Varg Vikernis. So instead of making technical generic death metal that sounded like the same goddamn riff over and over and over with doomy sections that sounded the same. They decided to go into a really cool direction that had a lot of really ridiculous riffs. The bassist Dag Nielsen did not like this direction. They decided to go the direction anyways and said, Fuck you, we're gonna make this awesome black metal album called Ablaze in the Northern Sky in 1992. This album isn't just quality black metal, it isn't just black metal of the highest caliber, it isn't even just god tier black metal. It's an intense barrage of violence on your ear canals. Even though Dag Nielsen didn't like this direction, he actually stayed to play bass on this album. And before we get any further, also we have to talk about how um, everyone except Dag Nielsen has a nickname from this point on, so I don't have to pronounce their bizarre Norwegian names. We have Ted, who we're just going to call Nocturnal Culto from now on. We have Galv, which we're just gonna call, of course, Fenrez, the funny motherfucker of black metal that's just nothing but a meme, and Ivar, which we're just gonna call Zephyrus. So that makes our job a lot easier. Now, even though I consider this to be one of the most important early, best fucking early black metal albums of the Norwegian scene, a lot of people don't consider it fully black metal. A lot of people say that it's actually blackened death metal and there's still a lot of death metal. I don't necessarily hear it, but I do hear a lot of progressive writing on this album and a lot of technical writing that was from their earlier stuff as opposed to what they would do on the next couple albums which is just repeat the same damn riffs endlessly for people that want a lot of songwriting meat and progressive stuff to their music this album is where you might want to start from them because there's a lot of very long songs in here like Catharian Life Co which is about 10 minutes long with a ridiculous amount of time changes a couple other really long songs too, like In the Shadow of the Horns, which is a slow-paced, very groovy, long song that gets really intense at the end. The lo-fi production is very great in this album, and it actually sounds, I'd say, probably a little bit better than the lo-fi sound of their later albums, because it at least kind of has a bottom end to it. Every song is an intense, lengthy, evil journey, and if you are the uh, feeble mind, I'm not sure if you'll come out of this alive. And even if you're just a human, I'm not even sure if you'll come out with your face intact. Best song on the album is the very catchy, riff-laden, epic song where cold winds blow. So Dag Nielsen fucks off and they go into an even rawer direction with the next album. 1993, the second album, and a three-part evil trilogy known as the Unholy Trinity of Dark Throne albums, we have Under a Funeral Moon. The 
low fineness in production on this album is just ridiculous. Instead of just having a really trebly sound that sounded evil, instead they're like, you know what, Nocturno and Zephyrus, unplug your guitars from those martial amps and plug them straight into that yellow jacket nest. Simplicity is key on this album, though. Everything's a lot shorter, and it's eight songs instead of six. It all feels a little bit more natural, and it's easier to digest. And like when I made the recommendation to check out Blaze in the Northern Sky if you like long songs and really diverse songwriting, check this out if you just want some straightforward, heavy music. I think easily the best thing about this album is Nocturnal Cultos vocals. They're at the absolute best on this album. I gotta say though, and a lot of people are not gonna like this, out of the first five black metal releases from the band, that's everything past Soul Side Journey, this album's actually my least favorite out of the five, but it's still very excellent. The only reason I say that it's my least favorite is there's one song that I not the biggest fan of this okay called into the deep woods embrace but when it comes to simplicity it's just way too much a lot of these songs are kind of the same thing over and over but that is literally the same tired riff that's not even that great played over and over and over and over endlessly but it's very hard to mess up black metal so even though it's ridiculously repetitious it's still not too long and the performances are nice so it's whatever but the rest of the album good god are their highlights Natasha and Eternal Sleep is really catchy, memorable. Summer of the Diabolical Holocaust is absolutely incredible. I love the doomy atmospherics of the dance of Eternal Shadows. However, my favorite songs come on later in the album. Crossing the Triangle of Flames is really dark and creepy. And I love how on a lot of their black metal albums, especially this album, that they stray away from just satanic themes, which the black metal scene gets a bad rep for. Deservably so. Especially with a lot of bands that literally do nothing but talk about Satan. I'm looking at you, Dark Funeral. But I think black metal is lyrically at its best when it focuses on winter and paganism and stuff like that. It gives it more of a mystical feel. My favorite song is the title track, and I also really love the song Unholy Black Metal. But the most interesting song on the album is the epic song. A song that mirrors the Bathory classic, Enter the Eternal Fire. We have the song To Walk the Eternal Fields. Absolute classic, the pinnacle of the band's discography in my opinion. It is the most simplistic thing ever, but it is so incredible because of it. And it's easily one of the best black metal albums of all time. I have no idea though, how some people actually hate this album. Yeah, I know a lot of people that think that not only is this their worst album, which is ridiculous, but that it's one of the worst black metal albums ever. Which I have to agree, on opposite day. Well, what's weird is they actually ditched Zephyrus for some reason. So it's just Nocturnal Culto and Fenris doing everything. So because it's just less people involved, you'd think that would be less quality. However, the two of them focused all of their creative efforts onto making this album. They focused most of their efforts on the music though, and less on the lyrics. And they got the savior of black metal, Uncle Dad Varg Vakernis, to do lyrics on some of the songs in this album. But for some reason he did them in Norwegian, so it just sounds like a weird clusterfuck vocally. Now there was some weird controversy where on the back of the album it said something that translated to Norwegian Aryan black metal which is weird, so they got in trouble for being anti-Semitic, which I highly doubt that they are anti-Semitic. I adore every molecule of this album. However, my favorite songs have to be as Flittermice of Satan's Spies, which has a weird back mask message in there. And then my absolute favorite song on the album, Scald of Satan's Son. Back to the music, what makes this album so amazing? It's because this album is the THC of black metal. It is black metal in its purest, most chemical form. It's pure, raw, evil, hard metal music with simplistic riffage that just repeats the same thing with very, very horrible, very video cassette recording. But underneath the mucky production and evil fog, you hear very beautiful melodies 
but you have to invest your attention to hearing the great melodies and the incredible riffs beyond the just horrible fuzzy static production because underneath all of it it's like brilliant classical music and that's the essence of black metal which is taking great songwriting and getting out their aggression through the really chaotic riffs and the horrible snowy blizzard sounding production which is what they grew up in. It's not just the essence of their musical taste, it's the essence of their personality. It shows that even though they're very antisocial, very dark, very cynical kids, underneath all that evil muck is a very pure soul. The soul of this album is like a graceful, beautiful, colorful butterfly that flies up to you in a very cold, dark place, and he whispers in your ear, Hello, friend. You're going to hell. The strongest thing about Panzerfaust is easily how recognizable the riffs and songs are from this album. You can argue all day what's the best Dark Throne album, and I even said that the last one is, but it cannot be argued that the most memorable songs, the most easily recognizable songs are on this album. Every song has its own form, its own direction, even though they kind of repeat the same things over and over, because this is, of course, the uh, simplistic repetition era of Dark Throne's black metal stuff. Every song is so dynamically different that they're all memorable and stand out, and all of them are equally good. I love the song Beholding the Throne of Might, which is really groovy and kind of reminds me a little bit of In the Shadow of the Horns. I love the really doomy Hordes of Nebula. I love the Celtic Frost worship of Triumphant Gleam. I love the mid-paced marching feel of Quintessence, the epic song, which Varg Vakurinus actually wrote lyrics for. This was around the time, I think, after he saved Black Metal. So, it showed that they were still friends with him even after he killed Euronymous. But for me, the two best songs of the album are the ones that are in the same style as the last album, the very fast black metal songs, like His Last Winter, which is great, but my favorite Dark Throne song ever opens this album at incredibly high speeds. We have A Wind of Sorrow. Yeah, the album's production is really weird. It sounds great, but the vocals sound atrocious. They're way too loud and way too ghastly that a lot of people say that they hate the album because of that. The album ends very weirdly, though, with a bunch of weird Norwegian chants and belts from someone. I used to think it was Varg Vakernus because it sounded a lot like him. But it's actually Fenris, which shows you the weird range that guy has vocally. <laughs> For a lot of people, Panzerfaust ends the classic era of Dark Throne, and Total Death begins, for uh, the purists, the bad era of Dark Throne, which I don't get it. To me, I'd lump Total Death with the early stuff. Even though it is a little bit thrashier, it's still more on the same lines as the first couple albums. I think this album is absolutely amazing, one of my favorite albums from the band. I wouldn't even put it below Under a Funeral Moon, I'd still say it's one of the absolute best ones from the band. And the lyrics for most of the songs are written by other people like Seder from Satyricon and that cringe poser lord from Emperor Ison. They experiment a little bit with their sound on this album, but it still works, it's still in the same vein and still in the same quality as the first bunch of albums. I especially love the very cold, empty atmosphere of this album. The album's littered with excellent songs filled with incredible riffs, but for me the best song is the thrashiest, most catchy song in the whole damn album, Blasphemer. After a three year long gap between albums, they finally released Ravishing Grimness in 1999. 
Now for me, this is the beginning of the second half of the black metal era of the band. But this time around, they kind of go for more of a clean production and more mid-tempo sound for this album. And even for the next couple albums, they're definitely a lot less chaotic. There's a lot less blast beats, and the production doesn't sound like a fucking beehive. You know what? I really like this album because of that. It's a lot more straightforward. And the number of songs is short, and there's quite a lot of long songs on, especially the whole middle of the album. There's like three seven minutes long songs in a row, and all three of them are my favorite songs in the album. I think the first two songs on the album are really good, Lifeless and The Beast. There's just something weird about those two songs. They have a weird rhythm to them, which is very, very different for the band. However, I think Claws of Time, Across the Vacuum, and Ravishing Grimness, my favorite being the title track, those three songs are the best songs in the album, and they have a lot more musical sections to them. There's a lot better songwriting to those three songs. Plague World came out in 2001, and the artwork on it, just gotta mention that real quick, looks really bizarre. What even is that? But that's besides the point. The music on this album is very, very good. Even though it took me a really long time to get into it, and even though a lot of people cite this as their worst album for some reason, it's not. It's very far from it. In fact, I would argue that overall, I think this album is actually better than Ravishing Grimness. And what else is funny about this album is that Apollyon, who would later join Immortal, actually does backing vocals on this album, I believe Sardonic Wrath. The production on this album is actually pretty damn good. They do a really good job of making it sound clean, but not too clean or too pretty or whatever. It actually sounds pretty heavy and kick-ass, and the music is ridiculously good on this album. We have some really long, amazing, epic songs like Command and Wreck, and then the shorter songs like I Void Hanger and Sin Origin are just filled to the brim with evil riffs. Now, even though it's song after song after song that are just absolutely amazing, I gotta say, Weekly and Avenger, the opener, it's a pretty long song. It's not nearly as good as the rest of the album. It's okay. The song gets better as it goes on, but man, the opening riff sounds like absolute shit. Other than the main riff of that song, it's absolute smooth sailing front to back. A great album. Ignore the first half of that opening track. Trust me, it gets better from there. Two thousand three's "Hate Them" is probably my least favorite of the black metal era. It's still a pretty decent album, though. I like pretty much most of the songs in here. There's definitely some weak moments, though, and I'm not a fan of the production. In fact, I really dislike the production because they go for more of a crust punk sound in this album. I just don't think it blends well, and uh, of course, we'll get to uh, more of that sound as we go along. But there's still some really awesome songs in here, like Divided We Stand, Rust is Incredible, Striving for a Piece of Lucifer is probably the best song on the album. But man, there's some shit on here, especially the worst song in the album, Fucked Up and Ready to Die. In 2004, they released Sardonic Wrath. This would be the last black metal album from the band for a long time. My absolute favorites on the album, Sacrificing to the God of Doubt. Not only is it a great middle era album, but it's overall one of their absolute best albums ever. They hated all these new popular black metal bands like Dimmu Borgir.
2006 The Cult is Alive takes a bit of a different direction. It's not as drastic as it would be on the next album. On this, it just sounds kind of like Sardonic Wrath, but a little more punky, a little more catchy, and a little more straightforward. And you know what? Even though I wouldn't maybe say it's better than a lot of the past albums, in fact, it's probably one of the weaker albums at this point that we're talking about, but you know what? Like I said, it's pretty catchy and it's pretty easy to get into. So if you're kind of a punk listener and you just think, what is up with this satanic surf rock that sounds like it's a wasp nest, you might want to check this out because maybe you'll find some really good songs on it. Maybe you'll want to hear more from the band, of course. And there are some damn good songs in here. Too Old, Too Cold was amazing. We even had a music video. Atomic Coming is excellent. Whiskey Funeral is a choice cut, and I absolutely adore the song Shut Up, which is probably my favorite song on the album. It's a little cringy, though, because it talks about how false black metal like Demi Borg here and Cradle Filth are ruining everything. It's like you just copy my style and you call yourself a man. You're all shit. You know, I don't know why anyone would waste their time or effort to copy someone else's stuff. You know what I mean? It's just bullshit. Do your own thing, you fucking faggots. But even though there's some great moments, there's some just really abysmal moments that are just really really questionable, especially considering the quality of most of the album is just so great and it feels like such a breath of fresh air. The last song, Preemptive War, is absolutely unlistenable. The Subterraneans is not very good, and this album features the absolute worst Dark Throne song ever, which is very debatable because later down the road there are a lot of very unlistenable shitty songs that Fenrez sings, but it's so cringy and edgy that just the sight of the album cover of this album makes me cringe just from the song alone, which is sad. The taste of that song will just never leave my mouth, and that fucking abysmal hunk of dick is known as Graveyard Slut. Graveyard Slut! Graveyard Slut! Graveyard Slut! That is one big pile of shit. Now, Cult is Alive felt very natural and very fresh, a nice good change of pace of the band. So does that mean that they're going to return to their old style and maybe continue Cult is Alive style? No, of course not. They're going to take it one step further. But now they transition into something that's not even black metal. It's crust punk with very cringy songs, ridiculous lyrics that are very immature, and then songs that are goofily sung by Fenrez. This album shows them transformed from a style that was really good and worked to their advantage into something that can only be described as midlife crisis rock. But it's not all bad, I do have to admit, the first bunch of songs are all pretty decent, they're all pretty catchy. I especially love the song These Shores Are Damned, which is really sad how the album starts out that good, and then it just keeps getting more and more lackluster as it goes along. I also like the catchiness of Canadian Metal, but man, once it starts getting to tracks like Fuck Off and Die, the title track technically, we hit rock bottom with ridiculous over-the-top, retarded vocals from Fenrez. Vocals that have more pitch than John Lester. If you pay my patience, this ocean lasts. That is one big pile of shit. In the depths of the underground! The 2008's Dark Thrones and Black Flies continues the Dark Throne trend of making horrible punk worship albums that's only truly great characteristic is the album cover. I must say it is a tiny bit better than Fuck Off and Die, but not by much. And that's only because when it comes to bad albums, I prefer an album that at least has songs that I can return to. And the first half of this album, for the most part, minus that hunk of dog shit, Hiking Metal Punks, 
But like I said, the rest of the songs on this side are pretty good, and it reminds me a lot more of black metal. And thank fuck that Nocturnal Culto sings most of these songs. But once our false sense of security of this album is over, we hit Grizzly Trade halfway through this album. But once you hit the last and absolutely the worst song in the album, Witch Ghetto, if you hadn't already, you're gonna be tearing your house apart to look for any morsel of bleach that you can swig. Bring me the ice of Mercury! Circle of the Wagons is still midlife crisis rock, but thank fuck it's at least okay. Most of the songs aren't very original at all, but at least they're catchy and at least I can stomach pretty much every song on this album. Except for the one song on the album that can only be described as Fenrez's cry for socialism. I am one in class. All day so I don't ever see your face. I am one in class. This the plan to stay break this one out of you. Silly Fenrez, he should have known that God threw people out of helicopters for making songs like this. I really love the lengthy, evil sounding Nocturnal Culto epic song the album, Stylized Corpse. But my favorite song is the very unoriginal but still so catchy it doesn't matter title track. In 2013, Darkthorn finally fucking got over the hump of midlife crisis metal. All their album covers weren't black and white and looked like comic book albums. It wasn't cringy, unoriginal crust punk that sounded like bollocks. But it's not black metal either, it's really weird. It goes for like a heavy thrash metal and even a little bit of pagan metal direction, which can only be described as my wife divorced me and took all the kids and all my money metal. But that doesn't mean it's bad. Midlife crises are very cringy and very awful. That's when you dye your hair like green. But you can't help but feel bad for the divorcee that lost everything to his bitch wife. So I feel bad for this album. So I kind of like it. There's definitely deplorable songs in this one, I must say. The ones you left behind is not very listenable. And Come Warfare, The Entire Doom is one of the most boring songs I've ever had to listen to. But other than the first three songs that are pretty excellent, pretty catchy, and pretty exciting, the final song, one of Dark Throne's best songs easily, that even though you could look at the time and be like, motherfuck, 13 minutes? But it's 13 minutes of pure, adulterated, divorcee metal. And this song, as great as it is, couldn't get any better if it tried. Fenra somehow manages to sound good on this song. But even though Dark Throne tries as hard as they can to try to not be what made them great, they should have learned a lesson from Metallica. You can't go through midlife crisis rock without returning to therapy metal. <laughs> 2016's Arctic Thunder surprised everyone. Even I didn't think it was going to be as great as it ended up being when I heard the first single, the first song on the album, Tundra Leech. I was like, wow, this is definitely kind of going a little bit more in the direction of like, the cult is alive, which is a good step. That means they're going through that therapy. And they even announced that the microphone had a restraining order against Fenra, so we have nothing but Nocturnal Culto ripping his vocal cords apart. And I gotta say though, it seems like it's a little too late, because it sounds like Nocturnal Culto's vocals are a little too ghastly but they're still pretty unique. Even though there's some bits of it that are not fully black metal and it's still a little bit of crust punk, it not only returns to the later black metal stuff like Plague Wielder and Ravishing Grimness, but it's the first time since like Panzerfaust or Transylvanian Hunger when I heard ridiculously high speed melodies from this band, which are especially prevalent in some of the best songs of the album like Burial Bliss and Deep Lake Trespass, 
I remember when I first got to Burial Bliss, I was like, fuck, they really are going back for black metal instead of that stupid shit that they did before. This album has a lot of variety. They have a crust punk song on there, like Inbred Vermin. And they have a really cringy song on there that's probably the worst song on the album. But it's still, like, the stuff that they were doing right before this, the Wyoming Distance. Like I said before, Tundra Leech is cool, but it's musically all over the place. It's really unique. But for me, the best song in the motherfucking album is a throwback to the sound of Total Death. A thrashy, catchy song with an addicting riff. None other than the title track, Arctic Thunder. Dark Throne's entire legacy is an excellent one, that an excellent story to tell, and it has a very, very good message for you kids out there. Remember, if someone steals from you, never, ever become midlife crisis rock. It sucks for you, and it sucks for your fans. And all you're doing is lying to yourself. You're not fucking Iron Maiden. You're not the Misfits. You're Dark Throne, and Arctic Thunder is an awesome testament to them returning to a style that actually makes sense and is actually Dark Throne.